Okay, so this, um, it's, go ahead and get start this session um, so we can um, move on here. Okay, so my name is Eileen Hoffman. I'm currently the president of the Ocean Sciences section, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the uh, Reberg Lecture, which is one of our section's named lecturers. Um, this lecture, the William S. and Carolyn Y. Reberg Lecture was established in 2015 by Bill Reberg. This picture is here, who has had a long and distinguished career in marine biogeochemistry research. Bill has been associated with AGU since 1968 and has had several positions with AGU, including editor of Global Biogeochemical Cycles. The Reberg Lecture is presented annually, but it alternates between ocean sciences and biogeosciences sections. And this year, the ocean sciences section is pleased to host the Reberg Lecture. The focus of the ocean sciences lecture is on marine geochemistry. And the lecture is intended to recognize a scientist who applies novel field or laboratory measurements to illuminate key issues in global biogeochemistry and marine uh, geochemistry. Today, our lecture for the Reberg Lecture is Alan Duvall, and he is a professor emeritus at the University of Washington, and he certainly made an impact on marine geochemistry through his research on nitrogen and sulfur biogeochemistry in the water column and in the sediments. He also studies the chemistry of low oxygen and anoxic marine environments. And he's done field work everywhere from the Arctic to the Eastern Tropical Pacific to the Arabian Sea, the Amazon River, and the local waters off of Washington. He developed the Oceanic Remote Control Chemical Analyzer, which provides a near constant stream of water quality data. For his many accomplishments, Allen was elected as a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, specifically for his contributions to marine biogeochemistry, especially elemental cycling and low oxygen water and sediments. So the ocean sciences section of the AGU is proud to recognize Allen Duvall as the 2018 Reberg Lecturer. So now I would like to invite Alan to give the Reberg Lecture on Denitrification in the Eastern Tropical North Pacific. I'm, I'm just figuring out the, the stuff up here. Okay, I'm gonna try it out. Um, I'd like to thank Eileen for her uh, flattering introduction, and I'd like to thank the uh, Nominating committee for selecting me, even though I can't figure out how they came to that decision or why they came to that decision. Uh, it also gives me a little case of uh, imposter syndrome to be up here, but I will continue to fake it through this lecture, hopefully, and we can get to the end. Okay, so what I want to do today is talk a little bit about, uh, first I want to talk a little bit about Bill Reberg. And then I will give a little bit of introduction about the history of denitrification in the, in the Eastern Tropical North Pacific. And then I will uh, move on to some research that uh, we at the University of Washington uh, are doing in conjunction with people at other labs are doing at present. And if I turn my head and you lose my voice, tell me and I will try and focus on the microphone that's right in front of me. Okay, so first of all, um, a little bit about Bill Reberg. I put that up there so you know what he looks like, but you already just saw him a minute ago. Uh, I've known Bill since the early 80s. Uh, Bill has always seemed like a mentor to me, except that, you know, he's basically, he's not that older than I am. He's just smarter. And he has helped me out several times in my career. Uh, one of them was, uh, with the, the first manuscript, the first paper I put up there, which is about uh, methane oxidation in Saanich Inlet. Bill was really a methane oxidation 
expert at the time, and I was doing sulfate reduction, and Bill said I should measure methane oxidation. And then he gave me some radioactive C14 labeled methane, which you, you couldn't buy at that point. I'm not sure if you can buy it now. Not that it's dangerous, but it's hard to make and not many people want it, um, or wanted it at that point. So he gave me the methane to actually make those measurements to allow me to publish that paper, and that gave a boost to my career and, and, and allowed me to, of course, get another proposal and keep my career going. And that was in 83, I think. I can't read it from here. It's up in there, and, and actually you may not be able to read it from where you are either. Um, the next thing he helped me was with, uh, in, in 1984 he invited me and uh, John, Christian to, John Christensen to go on a cruise in the, uh, in, on, on the Alpha Helix in Scan Bay, Alaska, and that's, that, that's what this shows. It's on, uh, on Alaska Island. Uh, in the Aleutians, and it was the perfect place to te test this benthic lander we'd been developing to look at nitrate fluxes. Uh, so we went there and we used the benthic lander to, and it was the perfect place to do it because uh, there was no oxygen in the bottom water, so there was no bio, bio turbation, bio irrigation, and we were able to show that the fluxes we measured agreed with the fluxes you calculate from pore waters, and that verified what we were doing, and Actually, I've been doing that ever since, benthic nitrogen studies. So that was another place that he helped me. So that's a sort of shout out to Bill and a thank you to Bill. Okay, now let's start with the uh, history of denitrification. Oh no, let's not start there. Let's just start with the nitrogen cycle. And I think you all know this, so I'll go through it really quickly. Uh, up here I've got four lines of text. The first one says molecular nitrogen equals N2. Well, that's just, uh, words in a symbol that are the same thing. The next, uh, uh, and molecular nitrogen is pretty useless biologically except to this narrowly defined group of, of microorganisms uh, called nitrogen fixers which convert molecular nitrogen to combined nitrogen. And by combined nitrogen I mean nitrogen that's combined with some other element, hydrogen, oxygen, things like nitrate, ammonia, particular organic matter. Uh, particular organic nitrogen, dissolved organic nitrogen. Uh, and that's what actually spins around in the nitrogen cycle here. Those things spin around and spin around. But at some point, one of those, or, or several of those, spin out into an oxygen deficient zone. And that's a zone where oxygen is so low that it, does, you, it doesn't support aerobic decomposition of organic matter. So you have to have some sort of non-aerobic decomposition. And that process is, one of those processes, processes uh, is denitrification. Denitrification is, uh, there are two kinds of denitrification. One is canonical denitrification, which is either heterotrophic or possibly chemoautotrophic. Uh, but canonical denitrification is the reduction of nitrate to nitrite to nitric oxide to nitrous oxide to N2. So that's one kind. The other kind is Animox. And Animox is a strictly uh, chemoautotrophic reaction in which ammonia serve as, serves as the substrate and the, the electron acceptor is uh, nitrite and those two react to make nitrogen gas. So nitrogen gas is a uh, loss of combined nitrogen and there are two ways that you can do it. Is this moving? No. The timer was not started. So now I don't know where I am. I mean, I know where I am, but I don't know where I'm in time. Um, okay. So the other thing I want, the third thing I want to point out in this diagram is that uh, these uh, two compounds, ammonia and nitrite, are both involved in either canonical denitrification or anamox somehow. So there's a lot of competition for these two things. You can tell by looking at all the arrows going into the nitrite and N2 pools. Uh, so you can put this cycle together very many ways, which means it's hard to take apart. It's complicated. Okay, so now let's move to the uh, history of denitrification in the Eastern Tropical North Pacific. Uh, I'm gonna do the first 100 years really quickly because the, the first uh, 100 years is basically just developing the tools to study denitrification. 
First thing you had to do was dis discover denitrification. That was done in 1988. Uh, so I've got the date and the authors, but I'm just going to read the, the dates and the, 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 uh, what they discovered uh, and, and the uh, references. So uh, in 19, I can't see from here. Oh, it's right here in front of me. In 1942, uh, and this, I did a Google search for when the ODZ was discovered in the e oxygen deficient zone in the eastern tropical North Pacific. ODZ in the ETNP. Uh, so that was discovered in uh, 1942. It's in figure 207 in the oceans. In 1952, uh, oh, and, but we could not put these two things together, denitrification and the ODZ, because we couldn't measure nitrate or nitrite. So that, we were able to measure nitrite in 1952, and that's the same method that we use today. Uh, and then in 1959, well, actually before that, but he published it in 1959, Brandhorst went to the ETNP and measured nitrate profiles, nitrate concentration versus depth, and he found two peaks in the nitrate profile, a primary and a secondary. And the primary was in the aerobic zone and the euphotic zone. He, call, he said he speculated that was due to nitrification, and the secondary was in the uh, oxygen deficient zone, and he speculated that that was due to denitrification. But he had no way to show it was due to denitrification because we still didn't know how to measure nitri nitrate. We figured that out. Uh, well, we figured out the method that we currently use in 1967, uh, and that was done by Wood Armstrong and Richards, and that's the cadmium copper reduction that we all use to measure nitrate or most of us used to measure nitrate. Okay, so that sets the stage now for actually starting to look at what's happening in the Pacific and how the cycle works. And I think the first significant paper that happened with respect to that was by this guy, Lou Cotaspati. Uh, Lou Cotaspati decided he was gonna figure out, he, he, uh, yeah, he was gonna figure out how to, what the denitrification rate was in the Eastern Tropical North Pacific by looking at the incoming waters that, that fed the, de the oxygen deficient zone, uh, and they come in uh, you know, near the equator and they move in here and topography and bathymetry and land masses steer some of that water back out in, the, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a westward flowing current that's at about 15 degrees north. And so what he was gonna do was figure out how much nitrate was in the incoming water and what the concentration was in the outgoing water and subtract those two to find out how much had been used up while the water was in the oxygen deficient zone uh, and therefore, and then integrate this whole section and get the transport. He called the difference between the incoming water and the outgoing water the nitrate deficit, again, how much is missing. Uh, and then he uh, measured the concentrations and those are shown here at the top figure, this is zero to, I think, uh, 1,000 meters, and this is the section that is shown down here from the tip of Baja down to about five degrees north. And these are his deficits, and they look very much like the deficit structure we uh, would measure today. Uh, he, he did the geostrophic currents by hand, and I don't know if you've ever done that, but it's not easy. Uh, but he had to do hand calculations to get all these. We did have a calculator. You went ka-ching, ka-ching kind of calculator, not an electronic one. Uh, but these, this is the, the geostrophic current structure in the same section. The, the solid contours are currents going eastward, and the, and the dash contours are currents going westward. Uh, so he multiplied the anomaly in mass per uh, cubic meter times the currents in cubic meters per time and got a result that he expressed uh, as in terms of teragrams per year, mass per time, and it was 23 teragrams, which is about pretty close to what we think it is today, maybe a little small. Uh, but that was the first ever, I think, uh, determination of denitrification, the quantification of denitrification in the ocean for a, a large area. Okay, now the next significant paper, uh, one that pushed the research ahead, not that, not, not, that, not that it was the only significant one, but it pushed the research ahead, was I think this one, 
Uh, this is by uh, Cottis Body and Christensen. They were looking at denitrification in the Eastern Tropical South Pacific, especially the role of nitrogen cycling. But in that paper, they put this table. And this, is, this, this table contains two uh, global marine nitrogen budgets. One uh, that was done by Kanki Liu in 1979. Uh, Liu took this from his thesis. I don't think that ever actually made it into print, but I'm not sure. And the other one is the one that uh, Karaspati and Christensen put together. Uh, and Kanki Liu's budget, you, you probably can't read it, but basically these are the inputs and these are the outputs of both. His budget is balanced at 96 teragrams input and output, and Liu's is really unbalanced. 90 teragrams in, 100 and almost 60 out. So now we have a budget that nit combined nitrogen budget for the ocean that's saying that says there's not enough nitrogen coming into the output into the oceans to match the loss of uh, nitrogen by denitrification and other processes uh, in the oceans. And the big difference is this sedimentary denitrification rate down here, which Liu had as uh, uh, something like 10, and Lou's got it 60. So there's the 50 difference, basically. So we all go out and study the denitrification, uh, you know, study denitrification to see uh, how this budget actually works. And then the next thing that pushed the study ahead was this uh, paper by Nikki Gruber and Jorge Sarmiento. And this is the paper where they introduced the NSTAR concept. This is in 97. And the NSTAR concept is that uh, if the ocean is in redfield equilibrium, redfield equilibrium being 16 Ns for every P, uh, then as uh, phytoplankton take up nutrients, they'll take them up in a 16 to 1 ratio. And as, they re and as that organic matter gets regenerated, It'll be, those, the, the nutrients will be regenerated in a 16, ratio, 16 to 1 ratio. And therefore, if you make a measurement of, of DIN, which is nitrate plus nitrite plus ammonia, which almost is always all nitrate in, in, in samples, if you make that measurement uh, and you make your phosphate measurement and you multiply your phosphate measurement times 16 and you subtract the two, it should be zero. I mean, that, that should go up and down together and you should never, the difference between the two should never be greater than zero. In reality, it is greater than zero, because if you do the plot here, what you find is that there's a plus 2.9 on, on the nitrate axis uh, intercept that you have to add. Um, okay, but anyway, they went on to take this uh, global distribution of nitrogen and phosphor, uh, DIN and uh, phosphate, and they looked at the global distribution and they come up with their own nitrogen budget. And they have actually, they came up with two. They came up with a current one, which is over here on the right, and this one next to it, which is the uh, pre-industrial budget. Both of those budgets are balanced within errors. And then they, they redid Lou's budget, uh, and his is still unbalanced. So now we've got a controversy about is the budget balanced or unba unbalanced. And we have not solved that. Uh, yet. That was in uh, 97. And then uh, just uh, out of hubris, I put this paper up because it's, I'm a co-author on it. But, but it's mostly Jay Brandy's work. We looked at uh, benthic denitrification isotope fraction, benthic, isotope fractionation dur during benthic denitrification. And we found that the fractionation factor was different for benthic denitrification and water column denitrification. So what this allowed people to do was then write two, two equations for the budget, of the nitrogen budget of the oceans. One was uh, the mass balance equation, and one was the isotopic balance equation. And because this, the, the fractionation factors appeared in both equations, we could eliminate one of the variables. So people worked on that for a while, and then something really big happened. Uh, two groups simultaneously sort of, or at least the two groups published the, the existence of Animox in the ocean. And I went through Animox, but again, it's ammonia plus nitrite goes to N2. And this was, a, this was a big thing. We didn't even know about Animox. And all of a sudden we have this new way to, to, do, to do denitrification. Uh, 
So this it was it was published by uh, Dalsgaard and 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 friends who are uh, they're a Danish group and then uh, Kuipers and friends who are a German group and they both came out at the same time. So then this, because this was so new and so cool, we all went out and studied Animox for a while, and it began to it began to appear that Animox was bigger than denit than uh, canonical denitrification, more important. And at that time, I was working with Bess Ward, who's at, has a, who's at Princeton, and we talked about this, and we thought, this doesn't make any sense in a Redfield sense. It's in, red, in a Redfield ocean, you can't have this happen. So what are we missing? And we thought, well, maybe it's the sinking particulate material. Because the way you sample for animal, you just take water out of a Niskin bottle and do your experiment. And that doesn't capture the sinking particulate material. So maybe it's, so we thought maybe we're missing the sinking particulate material. And we wrote a proposal to NSF to do that. Look at that. And they funded it. And we went to the Arabian Sea to do the experiments. And our paper came out that said denitrification is the dominant loss process. So we, now we've got another controversy going. And we haven't solved that one yet. And now I have to figure out where, we are, where I am. Uh, but these things still aren't so there's two other there's two other problems that we haven't figured out yet one is um, uh, we've done these are these are two unsolved ones and there's two others so I put up these sort of four major questions about the nitrogen cycle and the first one is is the balance one the second one is the animox and denitrification one the third one should be obvious to everybody it's uh, if oxygen minimum zones are expanding is denitrification expanding with them? And it would seem sort of logical that it would be. And then the fourth one is the same one we always ask, uh, how is this going to change? How are the other things going to change in the future? So we still got those things, uh, those big questions to look at. OK, so now I'm going to change gears and talk about what we're doing at present uh, at the UW and in conjunction with other groups. Uh, in 19. Uh, 95, um, Rick Kyle, who's in the office next to me and does sediment traps, and Curtis Deutsch, who is in the office one floor down from me and does models, and Gabriel Rocap, who is a building away, it's, it's, it's a long way, a long block away, uh, who does molecular biology, and me, who's just a run of the mill oceanographer. Uh, decided, why don't we combine all this, all our expertise, and submit an NSF Dimensions of Biodiversity proposal, which we did. And this is the this is the figure one in that proposal. But basically, what we wanted to do was capture sinking material in sediment traps. Uh, so the the title of this is the role of sinking in suspended material. So sinking material in traps. The McLean pumps aren't on this figure, but we're going to do suspended material with McLean pumps. And we we're going to look at uh, fluxes and, and, and rates in the traps and the, and the, and the, uh, not in the, and, and what's in the McLean pumps. And then Gabriel was going to look at all of the omics of the uh, nitrogen cycle in the eastern, eastern tropical North Pacific. And Curtis was going to do the model. Uh, and then we're going to be able to say something about those four questions. I forgot exactly what we said we were going to say. But we, we were going to say something about those four big, quest, big questions. Uh, so we are sort of in the middle of this. We propose to do three cruises. Uh, we've done two of the three. And I'm also including in this, in this figure a, uh, a, th a third cruise that we did in 2012 with, uh, the, with the Ward Group. And on all those cruises, the three that we've done so far, we've done some sort of north-south section of just hydrography. We've done, uh, on two of them, we've done this 110 section. That's the same section that Lou did in 71. And then we also have, uh, the other one, on another cruise, we didn't have enough time to do that one. So we did this sort of diagonal one over here. Then we do uh, two uh, six-day process studies, two six-day process stations, 
where we put out these trap incubators and Gabriel collects samples and we do the McLean pump uh, sampling and we do uh, and other experiments. And then on one of the cruises in 2012, we did a section from uh, Manzanillo, Mexico up here southwest to 110 uh, and uh, 14 north. So I'm going to take all that data and sort of combine it and talk about it next. Uh, I'm going to start with this Manzanillo 110 section just to show you what the distribution of oxygen nitrite and uh, oxygen nitrite and N star look like. Uh, these, these, have been made, these have been made in ODV and they're, they're such that the high, hot colors are high concentrations, the cool colors are low concentrations and ODV thinks purple is the coolest concentration. That's the color for the UW. Uh, no, I, that's, no, they didn't do it for that reason. But you can see that the purple in the oxygen distribution, if you look down there, the purple is like at zero. So this is all really low oxygen water over this, this 800 meters uh, or 600 meters of water depth and uh, 850 meters of uh, section distance. A lot of low oxygen water. Here's the nitrite distribution. Uh, you can see the secondary nitrite max, with the one in the oxygen deficient zone, that's the, the red and yellow you know, streak across here. And you can also see the primary nitrite max is sort of this little ribbon of blue in the, in the euphotic zone. So um, that's what that looks like. And then down here is the nitrate deficit. Again, how much nitrate is missing. And um, you can see sort of th th there's sort of two peaks in that distribution. There's a, a peak at about 300 meters, and then there's another peak at about 125 meters. The, the, the shallow peaks show a little bit as you go towards the coast. This is the coastal end of that section. So that's what things look like. I talked about trap incubators. So uh, this, this I'll show you the trap incubators and the, uh, and the uh, McLean pumps in this slide. So I'm going to start here on the left. Uh, this shows the trap incubator during a night deployment, but it actually shows things pretty well. Uh, the trap incubator consists of a one meter diameter uh, plastic funnel that funnels sinking material into this uh, long, uh, clear P uh, PVC tube that has three gate valves in it, these three things here. And the closing of those gate valves is controlled by this electronic timer here. So the way we deploy this is we, we get it all ready to go, we put it down in the oxygen minimum zone, and then we, it, and on, a, on a tethered a buoy that's on, on, a, on a line that's tethered to a free-floating buoy, and then uh, we wait about eight to 12 hours for oxygen, little bubbles or things that are trapped in there or oxygen that's adsorbed onto the plastic to, to, to all be dissipated. And then we close this bottom gate valve. Uh, it's a titanium slider. So we close this bottom gate valve and we collect sediments for eight to 12 hours. Uh, in this chamber, and then we close this middle gate valve, and that, and, this, and then when we do that, we inject some tracers into this bottom section, and that initiates some kind of experiment. I'll show you a, a, in a little bit uh, denitrification rate experiment that we did in there. Uh, while that experiment goes on for uh, one day to like three or four days, depending on depth, uh, we continue to collect particles in the in the uh, in the trap above the chamber. And then when we're ready to recover this thing, we close this top slider. So when we get this back on deck, we've got a sediment trap sim sample and an active incubation experiment that we've done. Uh, so here's, the, uh, here's, here's another picture of that. We're, we're setting it up here, but you can see the funnel and the, the, the tube here with the three uh, gate valves. Here's another little tube over here with two gate valves. This, this, this 
chamber here is the same as the incubation, same volume as the incubation chamber, and the gate valves open and close at the same, or, or not, they, they go down open. They close at the same time that the active incubation chamber closes, and they get the same tracer injected into them. So this, but this tube doesn't have a funnel. It's mounted inside, actually, here, under this funnel, so it doesn't get, it doesn't get many particles at all. So this is a control uh, sample for the, the active experiment that's actually got uh, a uh, tracer added to it. And this is just McLean pumps. Uh, these are the, we, each, each of our McLean pumps has two filter stacks and each filter stack has two filters, so we get duplicate samples uh, from every McLean pump uh, um, uh, deployment. And what I'm going to show you next is what the filters from all this stuff look like. We actually, when we get the, the, the trap incubator up, we take that water that we collected in the upper portion here and filter it. So this is the fine filter in the McLean pump. This is the coarse filter in the McLean pump. And this is the sediment trap uh, filter. And on the sediment trap filter, we picked off the really big things. So, but all of this came out of one deployment. This deployment was done at 265 meters at the offshore time series station, the offshore process series station. Um, the filter here, the coarse filter from the McLean pumps has what looks just like a uniform coating of little stuff on it. Uh, you can't really, to the naked eye, you can't see anything. I haven't looked under the microscope to see if you can or not. Uh, but you know, it just looks like a uniform coating. The, fi the fine filter, this is 0.27 microns. The 0.22 micron filter doesn't look like it has anything at all on it. Uh, but really, it's got tons of stuff, uh, I, I should say milligrams of stuff, milligrams of genetic material on it. Uh, and microbial genetic material. Uh, and over here, there's just a lot of easily distinguishable things. Uh, the things we picked off, this is a euphausid, and that's a live pteropod uh, on this filter. And the other stuff we picked off over here is almost, uh, they're all uh, shells of this uh, pteropod. Uh, let me get it right if I can. Halocyclus uh, uh, striata. It's known that this pteropod exists there. Uh, Lisa Levine's got papers on this. It knows, it's known it migrates into the oxygen, deep into the oxygen minimum zone in, in, the, in the day. Uh, so it's, it's sort of not surprising we find this, but I was still surprised. These are, really, these are really cool. You can't see it. You can't really tell what they are up there. But these, are, these look like uh, one to two centimeter little clear ice cream cones. Uh, plastic ice cream cones, but they're not really plastic, they're carbonate. So anyway, that's the difference. Oh, and also on here, there's all kinds of stuff. You can see fecal pellets. You can see little mineral grains. You can see blobs and smears of organic stuff on here. OK, so being a little more quantitative than that, what I'm showing you here is the suspended sediment concentration from the McLean pumps and the uh, uh, the, the, this, this, is, this is the mass of them. So this is milligrams per liter of suspended sediment, and this is milligrams per liter of things sinking in the ocean. Uh, because one's a flux and one's a concentration, it's hard to compare these things, but just looking at them, this looks uniform, and this one, you know, I can imagine myself putting a Martin power curve attenuation fit through it. Uh, so that they're, they're different shapes. Uh, on the uh, trap side, I want to point out a couple of other, so other things. First of all, sediment trap people usually put their traps at like maybe one really shallow, and then they start at 500 meters and go 1,000, 15, so on. They go deep. They rarely do traps between uh, the, the, uh, the picnic line and uh, 500 meters. This is I'm pretty sure more shallow traps that, than have ever been done in any other part of the ocean, any other area of the ocean. So that's actually sort of significant in itself. The second thing I want to mention is that if you look at the traps between 100 and 200 
they're really heterogeneous. They're, they're, they're just all over the place in terms of the, the actual flux. Okay, so now this is that uh, denitrification experiment data that I was going to show you, that I told you I'd show you. Uh, this is the, uh, the net um, uh, active, minus, uh, active minus control trap rate uh, for uh, the 2017 crews and a little some of the 2012 crews. And this does, you know, this looks pretty heterogeneous. heterogeneous. There's not a lot of things you can say about it, but it's heterogeneous. And the average is about 25 to 30, something like that. Well, the heterogeneous part is sort of not expected because the mass flux is heterogeneous. So, you know, it's sort of proportional to the mass flux, maybe. Uh, and um, the other thing is that the sort of average rate of 20 to 30, uh, I'm going to compare that now to the, uh, I'm not, I'm just going to tell you that the uh, control traps, or the control incubations have uh, rates of about five. So the, adding the particles to the water actually makes a big difference. There, it's really, uh, to say anything more quantitative, we have to know something about sinking speed and, and residence times in the water column, but uh, adding particles, the particles are important in terms of denitrification. Did I tell you how we did these? If I didn't, let me do it now. We basically added N15 nitrite and measured N15 N2 at the end of the incubation. Um, okay, so now let's move on to, let's continue with that particle thing, sorry. So here's some proteomic data. This, this figure's actually from a proposal. It's been published by Kyle et al. last year uh, in um, Biogeosciences, but this is the, the one from the proposal, a little easier to grasp. So proteomics, uh, actually the one on the left over here is actually just the oxygen and nitrate, oxygen and nitrite profiles. But these are the proteins associated with sulfate reduction. These are the pro proteins associated with denitrification. This is Animox, and this is uh, uh, dissimilatory nitrate reduction to ammonia, which I haven't talked about, but basically that's another nitrogen cycle cycle pathway in which nitrate is converted directly to ammonia. It's not a denitrification pathway, but the ammonia could feed into the animox pathway. The, the, the importance here is that the reds, the red dots in every graph are the particle associated ones, and or the large particle associated ones, and the other color, whatever it is, are the are the the smaller than the large particle one, you know, the, 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 the small particles, I guess. Well, I'm sure. Um, so denitrification is particle associated. That supports what I've been saying. Uh, and so is sulfate reduction. Uh, whereas Animox and uh, DNRA are associated with the small particles. So that just supports the fact that the large particle flux is important in denitrification. All right, now we're going to switch gears and talk about isotopes uh, uh, in, in these sample, in, in this area. So I'm showing over here the concentration of different nitrogen species, and over here are the isotopic composition of different nitrogen species. This is, this is all from a paper by Fuchsman et al. Uh, that just came out two weeks ago in print in DSR. Uh, the blues are nitrate, the greens are nitrite, the Oranges, or whatever the other color is, that I'm going to call it orange. Oranges are DIN, which here I'm defining as nitrate plus nitrite. Uh, the reds are the biologically produced N2, the N2 that comes from denitrification that we get from uh, mass spectrometry. And the blacks are the deficit, right? And the deficit should equal the biologically produced N2, and that's really sort of what it looks like. Thank God. Um, okay, so there's a lot of different things we can do with this data. I only want to do uh, one of them, and that is to uh, calculate fractionation factors for these things. If we, have, if we take a Niskin bottle and we sample it and we measure the isotopes and the concentration of nitrate, nitrite, and N2, we can calculate a fractionation factor for the sample in that bottle 
In fact, we can calculate it two different ways. They're not totally independent, they're only semi-independent. But we can calculate it from DIN or we can calculate it from N2. Uh, all right, so I did that. Here's the uh, equations and assumptions. I'm not gonna go into that because it, 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 I would just take longer than I need to. So I'm just gonna, sh just, we're just gonna look at the results. This is the offshore, th these are the offshore uh, stations and this is the coastal stations. Uh, and these are the, for each sample, for each sample for 100, at 100 meters, we have averaged, we've got more than one sample at 100 meters, so we averaged all those. And 200 meters, we averaged all those, and so on and so forth throughout the profile. So instead of showing you, I don't know what, let's say 85 different points, we've averaged them to make it a little cleaner. Uh, the red symbols are the fractionations, actually the isotopic effects the epsilons that we calculate from N2, and the blues are the ones we calculated from, calculate from DIN. And if you look at those two things, there's some things that sort of stand out. The coastal section uh, looks relatively constant at about 22, fractionation of 22, and the uh, offshore station starts out at about 22, but then it uh, fractionates more as you go deeper. Uh, and then comes, starts to come back again deeper than that. So there's structure in this one, and there's really not very much structure in that one. Uh, why would that be? Well, we, we sort of don't know. I'll, I'll give you a little hint, but that's about as far as I'll get, as far as we've gotten so far. Okay, so, um, let me peek. Okay, I know where I am. Okay, so, uh, so if these are the, uh, isotope of effects, let's, let's just assume for a minute that the isotopic effect is 20 per mil. So if I take the, if I actually take the measured nitrate and the measured nitrite isotopic compositions and I subtract the nitrite from the nitrate, it should be 20 per mil. I mean, you know, or 22 per mil or something like that. Uh, and the same is true for the other one. So it should be 20 per mil. So what happens if we actually do that? So here is, here is a plot of the isotopic, I'm gonna call it separation, the difference between the two in any one sample, the two that go together in one sample. Um, so everything above 20 here is nitrate minus nitrite and everything below 20 is nitrite minus N2. Let's start with the nitrite minus N2 ones. Okay, so you can't, okay, we have to, first thing we, is, we have to sort of forget the top 100 meters because that's all in the euphotic zone. It's oxygenated, uh, there are other, there's ammonia oxidation, nitrite oxidation, nitrate uptake, all this other stuff is going on up there. But below the euphotic zone, let's say 100 meters and below, the, uh, at the coastal station, which are these light blue ones, hopefully you can see that. I will tell you what it shows if you can't. Uh, below that, they all are around zero. Those, those, there's some in there and there's some there. They're all around zero, meaning there's no fractionation between nitrite and N2. That's why the, 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 uh, that's why the um, profile looks constant, uh, or looks uniform, it looks the same in the uh, shallow station. In the deep station offshore, uh, there's, there's, there's a change with depth, which is what gives that offshore profile some curvature, okay? So that's a little bit of an expl explanation of what's going on, but why it's going on, we, we, we don't actually know. Okay, the other thing is, that's interesting is, I'll go back and repeat this in case I forgot to say it. Uh, here, everything in the coastal, every, the, all these things at the coastal station are less than 30. And out here, even though they're structured, most of them are less than 30. But if you go back to the, the calculated difference, uh, they're mostly, they're, they're, they're all bigger than 30, basically. So how does that happen? How do you get a bigger separation than fractionation? Uh, well, Karen Cassiotti has been working on this problem for a long time. Actually, Karen's a co-author on this, on this Fuchsman paper. And what she has, the only way she's been able to explain this is with uh, 
a back reaction in the oxygen minimum zone of nitrite being oxidized back to nitrate. Uh, this reaction, and, and I've written the aerobic form of this, nitrite going to nitrate, and it's got a reverse isotopic fractionation. It works, works as like this. The regular, the, the, nitrate, nit, the nitrate to nitrate fractionation brings the two isotopes apart to their uh, fractionation, you know, to their 20 or 22 per mil. And then the reverse isotope effect actually takes the, so the nitrate is heavier than nitrate, nitrite, but the reverse fractionation takes the heavier nitrite out of the light pool and puts it back into the heavy and leaves the light pool even lighter uh, in, in nitrogen. So that pushes the separation apart. And using that uh, assumption, she can, she can make her isotopes balance if she has 70, 50 to 80 percent of the nitrate that gets produced in the first step of denitrification to nitrite reoxidized back to nitrate. So how does that happen in the oxygen deficient zone? People have gone out and looked for anaerobic nitrite oxidation by adding iron or manganese or some other uh, substance that could act as an electron acceptor, and they haven't been able to, to you know, conclusively show that. Uh, we can actually use oxygen if we're in the upper part of the oxygen deficient zone because uh, there's two chlorophyll maxes in the, uh, all the oxygen deficient zones around the earth. There's two others, one in eastern South, tropical South Pacific and one in the Arabian Sea. They all have this primary and secondary nitrite max, and the secondary nitrite max is actually in the oxygen deficient zone. It's almost all prochlorococcus, and you can show uh, the the, the uh, Niels Peter Revsbach's group in, in Denmark has done this. They, they have shown that there's actually oxygen produced in the uh, and in the in the zero oxygen environment. So you can do that up at the top, but how do you do it in the middle? Well, oh, and one other thing, Bess Ward has actually measured. She's put N15 in samples from the oxygen deficient zone. N15 nitrite in the oxygen deficient in those oxygen deficient zone samples and watch the appearance of N15 nitrate. So it does happen. Uh, how does that happen? Well, we were just at a, Bess and I were just at a meeting in uh, in August in Kiel that was an oxygen expansion, uh, expanding oxygen minimum zones meeting, but we got to talking about this and she mentioned this, this reaction. Uh, this is nitric oxide dismutase dismutation. Uh, two nitric oxides goes to an N2 and an O2, uh, and that's got a negative free energy, so it's favorable. Bugs could use it, uh, but, you know, we don't know if this goes on in there. And, what, it, and the reason we don't know if it goes on is because we can't, the NO is so reactive, it just goes away as soon as it's produced. Uh, and it would be a small thing in, it, with these other background. Anyway, we can't measure that with the techniques we have now. Uh, so how, does this really happen? Well, wh I was rereading some papers, uh, and this is what I found in some paper, in a paper that actually I'm, a co I'm an co-author on. This is another Fuchsman paper. It came out in uh, Frontiers of Microbiology last year. Uh, and it's about niche partitioning in the oxygen minimum zone. So it's a lot about m microbial stuff, but I'm a co-author on it for some reason. Um, so anyway, so this is a plot of different nitrification gene, denitrification genes up here, Animox genes here, and this is, a, this is a, just a general nitrate reductase down here. Uh, so, at the, so these are the, the reds are the particulates and all the denitrate, not all, but the denitrification Again, they're mostly associated with the particulate material. Uh, one gene sort of stands out. That's this Q nor B gene. It's present in, these, this is percent of the, the population that's in our, our uh, metagenome. So this is percent of the population in the metagenome. And the, the most abundant gene in a whole bunch is this Q nor B. The one below it is, is nor B. Nor B is a no nitric oxide reductase that takes NO to N2O, uh, and these are also nitric oxide reductases. Uh, 
Okay, but we argued that these are also the same. But I went back and looked at the gene tree, and this is not the whole gene tree, and I won't, but this is, the, this is part of the gene tree that's got sort of three, three little clusters in it. This cluster down here coming off that branch, this cluster up in here coming off this branch, and this cluster up here which goes up higher uh, coming off of a different branch. So I, I, I focused in on this because this cluster right here uh, contains our, the genes we found, which are the blue ones, the yellow ones, and this uh, orangey tan one, and some other genes that are known, this one and that one. This one, these genes come from a metha, uh, methanotroph, and these genes come from a uh, gamma proteobacter that is found in aquifers. These genes here are known NODs. What is NOD? It's a nitric oxide. It's a nitric oxide dismutase. It does that reaction. Uh, and these, these guys are known to have a nitric oxide dismutase. So does that mean that nitric oxide is actually undergoing dismutation in the oxygen mineral zone? Uh, we don't really know, but this is a mechanism that could do that. So maybe that's how the oxygen gets in there. That's just a hypothesis. Somebody needs to test that. But anyway, it's, it's, it's a hypothesis. So breaking off now from, the, uh, from that, I want to get to really quickly uh, expanding oxygen mineral zones and expanding denitrification zones. Here is that 110 section again. We've done that once. We've done this diagonal section once, uh, and the NOAA group has done this diag section recently. Uh, uh, we did this one in 2016-17, that's December into January. They did this one in 2016-17, in, in basically at the same time we did this one. Uh, we've done another one in 2012. This section's been done in uh, 2007 as, as a on, by Clivar. This section was, was done in 1994, it's WOS P18, it goes on to the south. And it was also done in 71, Luke Karsbadi did it. And we've got a 50 year time series of looking at that section, so maybe we can say something about expanding oxygen mineral zones. In order to do that, there's a whole uh, normalization process you have to do, and that's what this table is about. I'm, it's, it's, it's a well accepted procedure for time series comparisons. Uh, I'm not going to explain that. I'm just going to go on to what we. Uh, I'm just going to go on to the results. Basi but I'm going to explain how I got there. Uh, basically, we integrated the, the oxygen concentration and the nitrate deficit between density 2475 and 1,000 meters, and 2475 is in the in the lower part of the oxycline. So we in integrated the oxygen concentration, the uh, um, the, the nitrate deficit, and we integrated the thickness of the layer that was less than 10 micromolar. And here's, here's the results. This is, oxygen, um, this is oxygen concentration, and you see it looks like it's going down. This is uh, nitrate deficit, and you see it looks like it's going up, and this is oxygen minimum zone layer thickness, and you see it's going up, all, it's going up. All those indicate expansion of the OMZ and the DMZ. Uh, we have two more cruises to go, so when we, two more cruises, one to go and one to analyze, so we got two more cruises to add to this, uh, and that, the, set, the last one will be done in 2019, and uh, so we'll publish it at that point. So anyway, a little bit about that. I'm going to now, I'm done with the talk. I got to acknowledge these people's lab groups. Uh, Dick Richards, Luca Spotty, Bess Ward, Karen Cassiotti, Rick Kyle, Waji Nakvi, uh, Niels Peter Revsbach, Oswaldo Uloa, who's in, in Chile, and uh, uh, Calvin Morty, who's at PMEL NOAA, and me. Uh, not me, but the, the people that worked for me. All right. So that's the acknowledgement. And I haven't got any conclusions because we're not done, but I, I gave you, here's another list of nine sub-questions under the first four big questions. And I'm over by 34 seconds.
we have, <clears throat> we have time for questions. If anyone has a question. My God, it must have been yeah, perfect. No. Oh, it wasn't perfectly no. clear. They had to, they were stunned <laughs> for a moment there. Claire, yes. Um, since the thickness is expanding and we fixed the bottom of it at a thousand meters, it's expanding upward, sort of. Uh, yeah. Is that what you, is that it? And it's probably also expanding laterally, but we can't go beyond the boundaries of our data. So is it, yes, question. Yeah, sure. Well, that was an easy question. Yeah, right. So, yes, Raina. I'm going to do the cop-out answer. It's both. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's both. Uh, and whether it's permanent or just part of a long cycle, only CFCs will tell us. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Bob. Does the oxyclimb shoal over your time series, does the deep chlorophyll maximum stay at a fixed depth? Um, I'm going to answer that by saying this, that the secondary nitrite maximum is always at a particular depth and it's like, I can't remember exactly what it is, 24, 85, or, it's something, or 25 something, I can't remember, but it's always at that depth. Uh, so if that stays at the same depth, I assume the uh, chlorophyll stays, at, it moves, you know, on that density surface with it. Yes, in the back. Canonical denitrification. Uh, yeah. Uh, if, again, if you looked at, if I went back to that proteomic slide, uh, that was the, 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 the gene I was using there, the gene we were using there, was the NOS Z gene, which is the uh, uh, nitric oxide to N2 gene, which is part of the canonical denitrification pathway. And the Anamox gene, which is the uh, HAO gene, is the what it is part is is was not particle associated, not big particle associated. Okay. And last question, Jim. Um, I did a while ago. Let me see if I can recall what it is. Uh, I'd have to. I'd have to remember it. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty open question because uh, the well in ETNP the maximum N two O there's two two N two O peaks uh, one in the aerobic zone and one in the low oxygen zone, of course. And the aerobic one is the closest to the surface, so you'd think that would control it, but how much interaction, how much the top one is controlled by the bottom one, and uh, denitrification consumption of N2O, uh, I, I don't think we've got that. Well, Andrew Bevan actually has the paper about that in, uh, I think it's in Science, like a year ago. He looks at production and consumption of N2O in the, in the uh, oxygen deficient zone. And they're both happening. They're both happening. Okay. Okay, any additional questions? All right, well let's thank Alan again for a very nice lecture. <laughs>